Amen. Genesis 28. Uh, this is the part of this. This are parts of the Bible that I don't know. I guess people decide not to read because there's they think there's nothing in it, and that was me. Long time ago. And then God said, oh, yes, there is two something in it. You just, you just don't want to know it. And when I finally started telling God, yeah, I do want to know it. I want to know what's there. Well, then he started showing me. Uh, we started on Genesis 28, something like five years ago. I don't think it's been quite that long. But. Uh, now keep, keep in mind something, and this, this is going to play more into when we get into Genesis 29. Remember what Jacob has done. Now God, again, God has already chosen between Jacob and Esau. God said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. He tells uh, Rebekah, two manner of men, two manner of nations are in thy womb, two manner of people. Uh, they'll, they'll hate one another. They're always going to fight. They strove in the womb. And um, God said, that's how it's going to be in life. They're just always not, they're not going to get along ever. And uh, so that's just how it's going to be. And that's that. All the way back to the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, believe it or not, that and those events play heavily into the current political situation going on in the Middle East. To this day, it plays into that. Anybody don't believe that? Don't believe the Bible. I remember uh, when Barack Obama was president. Of course, he, uh, he, um, oh, what do they do when they give you, they promoted certain people in the Pentagon that held the same liberal, sort of anti-Christian, therefore anti-American views that Barack Obama held. And he elevated them in the Pentagon and gave them chief assignments and chief places and so on. Um, and that kind of left others out. Well, one of them wrote a, a um, sort of a policy mem memorandum or whatever, a speech that he gave or something like that where he said way too much of American foreign policy in the Middle East, we are, in, we are too much in favor of Israel and not enough in favor of the Muslim nations around Israel. Now, keep in mind something. No Jewish airplane has ever deliberately flown into a building in the United States of America. There are no Jewish suicide bombers. There are, there are there, none of that. Israel has never declared war, jihad, anything like that against the United States of America. Israel has been the ally of our country. We have been the ally of the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, ever since Israel became a nation, 1947, America has lined herself with Israel, and that's the right policy. But you got these guys that, like I say, Obama promoted them within the Pentagon, gave them, you know, high, powerful positions, and they come out with this nonsense that uh, Israel is really not a good ally to us and uh, we ought to separate ourselves from them and uh, too much of American foreign policy is based around protecting Israel. Well, why don't we protect the Palestinians? Why don't we protect uh, the Syrians? Why don't we protect the Iranians? In fact, why don't we just let them build nuclear weapons? Well... 
it's been known, I'm not telling you anything secret, but Roy's nephew, Al, designed the iron shield that exists over the nation of Israel. He designed that. He, he gets sent over there frequently. If you remember when Saddam Hussein was trying to shoot all them Scud missiles over at Israel and only about 10% of them were landing anywhere close to the right place. Do you know what that was? That was the program and the system he designed was designed to bring down before they ever had a chance to do any damage inside the Israel. Rightfully so. And I've talked to him several times about it. It's absolutely amazing. And whenever there's something going on over there, he's right back over there helping the Israelis with that system. Making sure that it's operating right, making sure they know what they're doing with it, and so on. And uh, it, it's just, you, you bless Israel, God blesses you, it's that simple. And here you have this president, and you have all these Pentagon chiefs who are trying to remove the blessing of God away from the United States of America by getting us to go against the people in the nation of Israel. N uh, they have no idea what they're doing. Now, so, but Jacob, just to give you a rundown of what he's done, Jacob has, for all intents and purposes, stolen Esau's birthright. At first... When Esau comes in from hunting and gathering in the field and he's about to die and he needs something to eat and mama's not there to fix it for him and there's no food and he tells Jacob, I got to have food right now. I'm not going to live another minute. I'm very, very weak. And Jacob said, I'll fix you a nice bowl of uh, lentils. Uh, but it's going to cost you. What's it going to cost me? Your birthright. And foolish, foolish Esau said, what good does my birthright do if I'm going to die? That was foolish. Now, on his part, that was God showing a foolish man has the birthright and I'm not going to allow that. Also, a foolish man squandered his birthright, which was an everlasting birthright. Not only would Esau have received the birthright, but he would have passed it down to his firstborn son. His firstborn son would have given it down to his son, and it would still be in the family to this day. But that's not what Esau did. So Jacob, whose name means supplanter, He's sneaky. He works under the table doing dirty deals and getting things that he wants, but it's not really the right way done. And then when their father, uh, Isaac, tells Esau, go out and kill me some venison. Bring and cook, up, cook them up the way I like them. Bring me some savory meats the way you do. Uh, bring me something to eat. My days are waning away. I can't see. Uh, you come in, do that, and I'll give you your... I'll lay my right hand on you and I will confer upon you my blessing. When um, Rebecca heard that, she took... Jacob, if you remember, she literally put goat skin on his arms and uh, probably perfumed him up with a little bit of goat urine and whatever it is to make him appeal, feel, and smell like a nasty, dirty, stinky animal. Because apparently the condition that Esau had it literally made him appear as if he had fur. 
not just to the sight, but to the touch as well. Because remember, uh, Isaac couldn't see at that time. And so twice then, uh, Jacob goes in. He's, mama's wrapped him up in his goat suit and rubbed him all down with uh, goat scent. And that's what daddy said. Yeah, you, you, you sound like my son Jacob, but you smell like Esau, okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty good too. And so he brings him in this venison and it's all nice and savory. So he reaches out and feels his arm. It feels like the furry arm. It's goat. He feels the furry goat arm of what he thinks is Esau. So he gives Jacob the, the firstborn son right hand blessing. And then, of course, Esau comes in later, realizes what's been done. Is there, any, is there anything left for me? And so on and so forth. So twice now, Jacob has sort of played um, kind of like Albert and Costello uh, or Abbott and Costello doing their money scam. If you've ever watched Abbott and Costello and they're making change with some waitress or Bud Abbott's trying to make change with Lou Costello, you know Lou Costello is going to end up losing 50 bucks right then and right there. Okay, and that's sort of what that's sort of what Jacob has done. His name is Supplanter, and that's exactly who he is. Now, those things always come back to get you. And I've said this before: God does not gloss over the sins of these people in the Bible. He wants you to know their character, what kind of people they are, the things that they've done. To hurt even members of their own family, things they've done. All right? So we'll get to that. Uh, but anyway, Genesis 28, um, that's of course what we have there. And I'm not going to go on any further with that. But um, let's see here. In Genesis 28, verse 6. Uh, the Bible says, when Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padanaram to take him a wife from thence, and that he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. That's exactly what Abraham sent his servant Eleazar out to do. Eleazar, I want you to go back to where my family is, where my kinfolk are. And I don't care if it's a first cousin of mine. I want you to go out and find a wife. Do not bring back any of the wives of the Canaanites, the Hittites, or the people that live in that land. I do not, I'm not going to have them. I'm not going to put up with them. I'm not going to take them as, as a wife for my son. Don't even waste your time. If you can't find what I'm looking for, then you just return back to me and I'll, re, I'll relieve you of your oath. But your oath is you're going to swear to me that you're going to find a wife for my son of my kinfolk. That's what Abraham uh, demanded for Isaac, and that is exactly what Isaac got. Now, Isaac is the same way. He is demanding that Jacob do the same thing. Esau, we believe, out of rebellion, took a wife of the Canaanites, the Hittites, just to rebel against mom and daddy for losing the birthright and letting Jacob uh, have his way with that. Esau was the firstborn son and should have had all of that, but he squandered it away. It's partly his fault. He rechained, and I've said this before, and people, this is it. Do not change over what you have that is everlasting for something that is temporary. Don't do it. You'll regret it for eternity. 
you'll regret it. Okay? Um, just as a side note, if you go out after church tonight and see them developing this land up here, up on the hill, uh, several years ago, the, lady, the old lady that lived in that house next to the parsonage, her name was Miss Sims. And um, she was, I don't know, was, we never made her mad. I don't think she ever made us mad, but we weren't the closest of neighbors. But she used to have to mow that whole field by herself. And I remember at least two occasions, she'd get out there and mow it and get so sick of it. She came into my office on at least two occasions. The first time she said, I got to sell that property. I can't keep mowing this. I'm too old for this. I can't keep up with it. I got to get rid of it. And she said, the first time she made us an offer, I don't know how many acres that is up there, but she said $100,000. And I, and back then we didn't have nothing. I said, Miss Sims, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I would love to take that property from you. I said, you know, maybe one of these days we could put something nice on it or whatever for our church or our, our kids or whatever. I said, but there's no way we have, we don't have seventy a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. And I don't think we'll ever be able to borrow $100,000 from the bank unless we go out selling bonds. And I said, I don't know anything about selling bonds. And I'm just, I'm just going, I just don't know how to do this. And so, no. Well, she come back a year later and dropped the price down to 75 grand. Now, I was wishing that we had 75 grand because... That property was eventually sold, and I guarantee you that's over a million dollars. Because the same real estate company came and talked to me about selling this property. And I went, nah. And the guy, young salesman, he said, well, sir, he said, you're shaking your head no, but you haven't heard what I'm going to offer you for this property. And I said doesn't matter I said this is our home this is I've been here since I was a boy it's home it's our church I said all that out there if you were to go out there and look at our sanctuary we couldn't replace that for I don't know how much money it'd take to make our church look like this again and I just said I'm just not interested in selling it but I imagine it would have been several million dollars they offered us for this and I turned it down. So when I look up at that property and I see them digging up there and developing it, I'm going, oh, why couldn't God give us $100,000 or at least $75,000 one day? I could have bought it and it then sold it for quite a bit of money. But anyway, it, that's just the will of God. Amen. It's the will of God. Uh, but anyway, um, he says in here, uh, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan again, and that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother, and he was gone to Padanaram, and seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael, and took unto the wives uh, which he had, uh, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the, the sister of Nabajoth, to be his wife. In other words, he did exactly what Abraham did not want him to do. What Isaac didn't want him to do. Esau was in rebellion against God. And he did it just to make his mom and daddy mad. I'll marry these two girls just to make my mama boil come Christmas time. Well, they didn't have Christmas time back then, but you get the idea. Now look at verse 10. Genesis 28. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Haran. Who is Haran? All you who are ignoring me. Who is Haran? Sister Helen. 
rhymes with heron. Who is heron? Anybody know? Paige, who is heron? Huh? The bird? Not an H-E-R-O-N, an H-A-R-A-N. Who is Heron? Heron. Heron is the son of Tira. Did I get it right? And Tira was who? Abraham's brother. Write that down. In case you get asked that question again next Sunday night. And I say, who's Heron? You go, oh, I know who it is. Heron is the, uh, is the, uh, the, yeah, the, uh, is the Tira. Yeah, and Tira is Abraham's brother. And yeah, okay. It's the family of Abraham. Um, so at least Jacob is going in the right direction. Now watch this. Verse 11. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows. Now I'm one of these, I just don't think pillows are a very comfortable or stones are very comfortable pillows. It's possible he may have taken his cloak or some sort of cloth, laid it on the pillows, something for a, soft for his head to rest on. And he lay down in that place to sleep. In verse 12, he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. Behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Now, what is that ladder doing there? What? It's coming down from where? There was a ladder set up on the earth. The top of it reached where? To heaven. Which heaven do you think? Jaden, which one? Where the limo is? Beyond the roof? Beyond the sky? To the moon? Beyond outer space? Okay, that's called the third heaven in the Bible. The third heaven is above all of outer space. Outer space is above the sky. The sky is the first heaven. And outer space where all the planets are and all the other stars are, that's the second heaven. And the third heaven is where God is. It's called the heaven of heavens. So this ladder went all the way up to the third heaven where God is. That's a long ladder. Right? Do what? Yes, it would take um, traveling at the speed of light, which I'm pretty sure angels could do. According to what we know, it would take probably 15 to 16 billion years just to get there. And then another 15 billion, 16 years to get back. But they're angels. They can travel faster than that. All right. So he sees a ladder. Set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And I want you to get the symbolism of this. 
This ladder is what is connecting earth to heaven. It's bringing them together. So if you were to remember how Jesus is always in the Bible, the Old Testament, but he's hidden in different ways. Would this ladder then be Jesus? Yeah. John's up there. I think he's ready to do flip-flops. He's up there going, Woo! I'm telling you, y'all should come up here, sit behind me one Sunday and watch everybody else, how they react. Anyway, the top of it reached to heaven and behold, here it is now, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Now, angels are made of fire and light. So you have this ladder and you have these light things going up and down the ladder constantly. Okay? Now... The Bible actually tells you that this ladder is Jesus. Turn to John chapter 1. The Bible tells you this. That Jesus was in fact... So here it is. Uh, Jacob has just seen Jesus. But he doesn't know he's seen Jesus. He knows that something irregular, not normal, supernatural is taking place here, but he doesn't know who it is. So John chapter 1 fills in the details. Remember what you can't figure out in the Old Testament, you'll be able to find it in the New Testament. So John chapter 1, verse 43 the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip. And saith unto him, follow me. Remember, Philip is the only apostle who got beamed up. He did. He got beamed up. He would come up out of the water and beam me up, Scotty. And all of a sudden, he disappeared from that place and ended up way out someplace else. Just like that. Okay? Now, Philip was was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? It'd be like, Joe, be like us saying, can any good thing come out of Fredericktown? I mean, it, what if we, in our time, Jesus had been born and he had came from Fredericktown and we would be going, yeah, I don't think so. Or, or worse, Potosi. Okay, Potosi. That's sort of the idea. Those of you who live in the area, you know. In your own area, pick the worst town of rednecks, double necks, cheats, liars, whoremongers, meth cookers, drug dealers, people with no teeth, half teeth missing. Pick a town full of people like that. East Bonterre would be a good one. And anyway, um, St. Genevieve would be a good one. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, come and see. Nathaniel's already rejecting him because he's from Nazareth. Okay. I don't, I don't, I'm not interested. You said he's from that. That automatically puts him off my list. I don't care who he is. He's from Nazareth. I don't like, I don't get along people from Nazareth. So in verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith unto him, Behold, in Israel, indeed, in whom is no guile. He said that to Nathanael. Nathanael's the one who's going, 
He's from Potosi. I don't care who he is. He's from, he's from uh, Nazareth. He's a Galilean. Why should I even listen to this guy? But now Jesus says this to him. I found a man who, with whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, whence, the, whence knowest thou me? How do you know me? Jesus answered and said unto thee, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. He said that on the basis of one thing that Jesus said to him. One thing. And now he's ready to follow Jesus with all his heart. You're the son of God. You're the one. I know, I know now you are the son of God. And then uh, Jesus, verse 50, answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter... Ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now go back to Genesis 28. I've got it up on the screen, verse 12. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. So who is this ladder? Jesus said it was him, the son of man. You're going to and and he said, "Nathaniel, you this is not just a a thing in the past. Maybe Nathaniel when he said that, maybe Nathaniel remembered his Sabbath school lesson about how uh Jacob saw a ladder from heaven that reached up to heaven. And the, how the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And he had always wondered about that. But now he sees the ladder face to face. He sees him. He's looking him in the eyes. And the ladder says to him, Nathaniel, you're going to see something greater than this. One of these days, you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending upon me. The son of man. Nathaniel's hair, probably doodad, stood up on the back of his neck and tears welling up in his eyes as he's thinking. He's the ladder that our forefather Jacob saw. And I just saw, I just talked to the ladder. And that has a has a thing where it, it affects a man. It changes a man. It softens him. No matter how he starts this thing out kind of rough. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I got my doubts about this. Hey, Nathan. A man in him in whom is no guile. Nathan said, he's saying that about me? And then when he tells him that he was the ladder where the angels of God ascending and descending on him, I'm sure that Nathan can barely contain himself. I'd be wanting to just start crying right then, going, I, 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 I don't know what to say. Because he now sees the Son of Man, the Son of God, and he understands now something from the Old Testament that nobody ever understood before because it was told right to him. You remember that ladder and the angels ascending and descending on it? That's me. And one of these days you're going to see those angels once again ascending and descending on me. Now, let me show you this. This is, this is DNA. This is your DNA. And it was designed 
to be a ladder. Okay? It was designed by God. It's not an accident that it looks like a ladder. And by the way, uh, let's see here. If I have any way to mark. Uh, let's see here. Highlighter. Maybe I can do that. See this right here? It's probably not the right color. And this right here. That's the two rungs of the ladder. The two legs of the ladder. And the angels of God ascending and descending on that. Remember, angels are, are made of fire and light. Now, these two legs of DNA that I just showed you, they're made of phosphorus. What does phosphorus do, Chris? And when you dip bullets in phosphorus, what do, they, what do you do that for? They're tracer bullets because when they fire at night, you can see them because they light up. Yeah. So at night, you can always tell if you put in like every fourth round is a tracer round. You shoot three rounds and the fourth round tells you where the other three rounds are going. And you can more better aim. Yeah, it does. It's exactly right. Because it's going so fast. Okay. Well, that would be what you would see if you were to look at DNA because it's made of phosphorus. And sugar, and sugar burn. The whole thing is made to be light, a lamp. All of your DNA is made of the two compounds that it takes to light a fire. Sugar, phosphorus. And they both light up and... They transmit information and it looks like lights going up and down the two rungs of this ladder. It looks like angels ascending and descending on a ladder. Just like what Jacob saw, just like what Jesus, Daniel, he would see. This, I love this stuff. What we know about DNA it's usually rolled up in a helix form, twisted or crooked. Crooked is the Bible word for it. The two spines or the two legs are made of sugar and phosphorus. They're linked together by four compounds. And they're bonded by hydrogen. Now, let me give you a little lesson in chemistry. This is real easy. Every, every atom in the universe has a certain number of protons, electrons, and neutrons. Who remembers that roughly from school? The electrons spin around and rotate like the moon rotates around the earth and the earth rotates around the sun. Then the electrons spin and rotate around the core of the atom, which has the neutron and the electron in it. Neutron means it's a neutral charge, has no charge whatsoever. The proton in the middle has a pro or positive charge. The electron spinning around out, outside has an uh, electron charge or a negative charge. Okay? And they basically do this little dance. And what you're looking at with hydrogen is a perfect picture of the Godhead. You have two in the middle and you have one on the outside. And hydrogen's atomic number is one. Because it only has one proton, one neutron, and one electron. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And John said, 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. And these three are one and that's what hydrogen is and hydrogen is the component that holds all of 
the DNA together. Okay? You know how water is sticky in some cases, right? Something wet, if it has a wet surface, it's kind of sticky. And that's called a hydrogen bond. Okay? It's the hydrogen in the water causing that. All right? So here you have a picture of God, and He's the one literally holding everything together. Think about that. Okay? And then the four things in the middle, like the steps of the ladder, are just four compounds. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. You don't have to remember this. But it'd be neat if you did. Okay? Because if I talk about this again, you go, I remember that from the last time. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. And so it's those four things that join together in the middle that hold the ladder together. So now, and the rules are, you see up here where you have AT and TA? Well, that's the rules. Adenine can only link with thymine, only. And thymine can only link with adenine. adenine. So they're, they cannot, they're, they're like a, a round peg and a round hole. So if you split DNA down the middle and you have adenine, adenine, thymine here, what do you have to have on the other side? Thymine, thymine, adenine. You have to have their exact opposite on the other side. That's the only way it'll go together. So Isaiah wrote, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail and none shall want her mate. They're perfectly mated together. And it's the same way with the C and the G or the G and the C. The C is cytosine, the G is guanine. And only cytosine can go into guanine and only guanine can link with cytosine. So in DNA, if you have adenine, adenine, cytosine, on this side, you have to have thymine, thymine, guanine. You can't have adenine here because they don't. You're putting a square peg in a round hole. And it won't work. So whenever a cell in your body splits and becomes a new cell, all that has to be done with the copy of the DNA that's in your cell is that it takes it and it splits it. It unzips it right down the middle and sends half of that over to the new cell. The new cell automatically knows how to make the other half of what's missing because of those rules. If it sees adenine, this has to be thymine. And if it says guanine, this has to be cytosine. Okay? It's the only two. Now, let me ask you this question. How many Gospels, out of the four Gospels, how many of them tell you of the birth of Jesus Christ? How many? I, I see your hands. How many? Two. How many don't tell you the birth of Christ? Two. So you can see that two of them, Matthew and Luke, go together because they both tell you the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, while Mark and John completely skip over that and they start Jesus they start the gospel when Jesus is 30 see how it works okay so that's and it's sort of like a morse code because in this is how your genes work your genes work because in the combination of A, A, C, T, G, T, whatever, those are the letters that make the words of the genetics of your body. They're the part that has, uh, we were being asked earlier, 
Mike, how, how come so many of your kids and grandkids got red hair? And I pointed to Sweetie Pie. I said, it's her fault. Her hair is auburn. Her mom's got red hair. Her, her mom's mom has red hair. Her mom's dad had red hair. That old red hair runs on that side of the family. And it's Sparky and Matthew and Elena and Gwen Darling and Hunter and who all else? Huh? Reagan and Graceland and then Cheeseburger and Alicia. I look like me. That's a strong breed in there. Amen. When was that written? The moment they were conceived. It was all written that Lawson's hair was going to be brown like mine. And so was Alicia's. Okay. Um, but anyway, it's written out like Morse code. There's a code for every gene that those things spell out. Now, I won't get into all of this, but basically, the way that the three codons, let's say it's adenine, guanine, and cytosine, the way that those three codines, codons, codines, <laughs> are arranged make the letters that make the words of your genetic structure. So basically what's going on here is, watch this. I'm going to do an illustration here for you. Here is Here is the one ladder rung leg and it's the Old Testament. Here is the other leg of DNA. It's the New Testament. What binds these two parts together is this right here, Chris. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because right here is where the words are. And the words are Jesus. That's why John, the fourth gospel, says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in your DNA, the words that make your genetics are right here in these four things, arranged in, in an absolutely perfect order. When they started trying to read the, the DNA uh, script, they thought that they were going to find like just a, a mishmash of different codes just splattered everywhere. But that's not what they found. They actually found, Chris, that at the end of one gene that said, you know, Matthew's going to be redheaded, freckled face, there was what's called a stop codon period at the end of a sentence and then right next to it was a start codon that said here's the next set of genetic instructions just like chapters and verses in your bible they're written into your dna isn't that cool so here we are man who is so smart we're rewriting the genetics of literally every species on the planet. I guarantee you, in a lab somewhere in this world, literally every species on the planet is having their DNA mixed up, added to, taken away, including humans. You just don't read about it in the paper. You only read about the ones that they actually succeed in. Okay? But I believe nature's balanced, don't you? And so what if we change what if we change the flowers so that the flowers are more fragrant so the stores can sell them? 
but the bees that pollinate them don't recognize that amount of fragrance and so they won't pollinate them. What will happen? The flowers will die off, the bees will die off. Do we need the bees on the earth? Shoot, yes. So we're playing God with a book that God himself wrote that we're not good at. Just as he tells us as believers, don't change anything in this book because you're dangerous. God says to all the genetic scientists, don't change anything in here. You're dangerous. And I believe that that very well could lead to some of the curses in the book of Revelation that God said was going to come to the earth. Okay? All right, that's it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Appreciate you staying with me tonight. And uh, if you read, if you keep reading Genesis 28, the rest of it is about seed. Isn't that something? The rest, the rest of Genesis 28 from 12 on is about, see how many places I have underlined? Seed, 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 seed. That's because that ladder came down from heaven. And that ladder is the DNA seed of all life. Father, bless your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the wisdom, the beauty, the things that are in this book, God, that we may have never considered before. Lord, it is always a joy for me to be able to teach them. And Father, just bless our families. Bless those, Father, who really need help today. Pray that you'd give them grace. And Father, Lord, bring revival to some people. They need it real bad. Bless us, we pray, and dismiss us in your care. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen.